Um, so today I would like to explain a little bit all the work that we have we have done so far in the lab with the GCQ Orbitrap. Um, but basically I have selected some examples uh, showing the, the best sensitivity and selectivity that this instrument can, can bring us. Um, yeah, so just a brief summary of my presentation. Um, I would like to introduce my lab. Um, then I would talk about a little bit how we use the Orbitrap technology there for food analysis mainly. And I would present the methods that we have developed so far for PBDs and PCNs. And also I will show you an example of real samples that we had to analyze and see what was the problem there with some of the pesticides. So our lab, the Laboratorio Agencia de Salud Pública de Barcelona, it's a public health laboratory. Uh, we are settled in the city center of Barcelona, Spain, and we are an official control lab. So our mission basically is to help ensure food safety. So we have more than 30,000 um, 30, samples per year, and we analyze chemical components and also microbiology. Um, so basically we have to develop methods uh, that they have to fulfill regulations and our methods should be under accreditation um, because basically all our results can have very uh, important legal consequences. So our methods should basically follow some regulations, especially in Europe regulations. So we have uh, some yeah, European um, reglementations based on the instrumentation, also validation of the methods, how we should carry on this validation, and basically, in depending on the field, so pesticides, veterinary drugs, marine biotoxins, or whatever, um, we also have um, some documents that we have to follow, or some kind of guidance that it's um, applied for all the labs, so that at the end, all the results can be comparable. So when I would talk about food safety and, and, and food stuff and, and the, the kind of samples that we can receive in the lab, uh, well, we are receiving all kinds of samples. Um, anything you can imagine, we can receive it in the lab and they can ask for any analyte. Um, so that makes life a little bit complicated because we have to have very robust methods and fast methods. and. So we have to work a lot on the extraction part um, and also we rely a lot on our instruments um, because we need to have results. So sometimes sampling campaigns we can schedule over the year and we, re we receive many sampling campaigns that are more routine analysis, but we also receive samples that are alerts that came from any part of Europe or yeah, some problems that has been um, on the news because some public health problem in, in the city or anywhere in Europe. So we have to you know, manage and, and give a, an answer to our um, local government or to our Spanish government. Because at the end, what we need is to have this kind of report. So we need the analytical results to be really reliable. Uh, as I said before, we can have really um, legal consequences, any result that we are giving. So that's why it's really important that we work under accreditation. And so in our case in Spain, we have ENAC, that is our accreditation body, and it, well, they visit us regularly so to check how, are we, how we are doing. So how was Arbitrap work um, just helping a lot on, on all this work that we have to do usually in our lab? Uh, it was back in 2011 that the LCQ Arbitrap first was installed in the lab. Um, at that point, the strategy was, OK, we have so many um, methods at the moment running. And we know that some of them, we have problems of limit of quantifications or problems with very complex matrices that we cannot really have um, very robust results with uh, triple quads. So we decided to move all these methods to the LCQ Orbitrap directly. An example would be, for example, um, hormones in urine. So we, we just validated all the methods that we prefer to run directly on the LCQ Orbitrap. And for other methods that were running quite well on triple quads, I mean, we are still using triple quads. We have plenty of them. 
But um, what we had established in our internal protocols is that we're going to confirm any uh, doubtful result that we may have or any result that would be close to the maximum residual limit or any result that we can have some legal consequence, we're going to go and confirm with another technique. And in this case, we are using the LCQ orbitrap. So as I said, for example, for veterinary drugs, hormones and urine are run directly in routine in the LCQ orbitrap. Also for marine biotoxins, because um, so we can have fresh muscles, for example, but also kind of canned muscles. Uh, then the matrix is much more complicated. So we are also um, using the LCQ orbitrap for this kind of samples. And it really helped a lot because we had uh, many cases, I mean, many, not hundreds, but some cases of false positives and false negatives coming up. Um, so we are pretty sure with this technique that at the least we can confirm our results. So it, I mean, you know, when we are giving our reports with the analysis, we are pretty sure of the results that we are giving. So um, that was on LCQ arbitrap, but of course for GC we didn't have this additional uh, technique since, well, the GCQ arbitrap was on was available. Um, this is a picture that the one of, that we have in the lab nowadays. It was installed December 2015, so it was basically a Christmas present. Um, and so far, so it's almost one year and a half that we have this instrument. And well, you, you already know the, the working modes and acquisition modes that the instrument have. There is so many options in, the, in this instrument. And so far, we've been trying with full scan target SIM and target MSMS, so it's PRM in the new software uh, of Orbi. Um, and we have developing methods for PBDs and PCMs because we, we do the extraction together. So I would explain a little bit how, how we were doing that. Some, some work now on non-dioxin-like PCBs um, because of the new regulation that came up in April this year. And also, uh, we have developed a full method for pesticides. So today I'm just going to show you a few details on, on this method. OK, just an overlook of the um, scheme of the Orbitrap. Um, we have seen, we, we saw it yesterday for the LCQ, so it's, uh, it's basically the same. Um, but here we have the ion source. We can have um, electron ionization or chemical ionization. So you can have both, um, just changing the, the cartridge. So it's quite easy. Then you have the ion optics, and you find here the quadrupole. Um, the C-trap, um, well, it's quite important. I will show you some examples how we can overcome some tiny problems that we can have on the C-trap because of saturation, because at the end, it's an ion trap. So I mean, I guess many people working with ion traps know advantages and disadvantages of, of these uh, mass analyzers. And that's also happening here. But I mean, it's quite interesting to to take into account the different parameters that you have to optimize in the in the C trap. Um, here we have the collision cell, as in the L LCQ orbitrap, and yeah, the the orbitrap mass analyzer. In this case, um, we can run up to 120,000 resolution, and it's quite fast. So for all the methods that I, I was showing before that we have developed so far, we were testing different resolutions. And we are working between 30,000 and 60,000 resolution because we didn't need much more, at least for the moment. Um, but we have tried also the maximum resolution to see how fast is the instrument scanning. Um, because of course, in gas chromatography, our peaks are much narrow. Um, so we were having up to seven, eight points, so scans per peak, uh, just using the high resolution, resolution. So, I mean, this kind of orbitrap, it's this like high top uh, orbitrap, so it can just scan faster than the one that we have in the LC. So if we compare them. Okay, so just moving into the applications that we have run so far. Um, this is a regulation. It's a recommendation, so it's not really a regulation that we have in, in Europe. It was coming up in 2014. Um, this recommendation, uh, it's come from the, com the European, European Commission, um, and it's a consequence of the six scientific opinions that EFSA, so it's the European Food Safety Authority, uh, was uh, giving about prominent flame retardants. 
um, if you go through these six opinions, uh, you would find out that the main conclusions were that, well, we don't have enough data um, to make risk assessment. So we, they, they were basically saying we have lots of data or kind of data for PBDs, but not for the rest of um, BPRs. Um, so they were basically uh, calling for data when, when, up, when just taking out this recommendation. Um, what, what's on this recommendation is basically, I'm going to focus on the first group only, uh, but they were establishing which congeners should we um, analyze. Okay, so for PBDs, we should analyze all these congeners. Um, then they were saying in which matrices should we analyze them. So here you can see the list of matrices for PBDs which means basically everything you can eat except for vegetables, so any food stuff that, that, you, can, uh, that you can have, we, we should be able to analyze and report um, uh, data to Europe. And the analytical methods, they were establishing so, some limits of quantification so that uh, data can be comparable, basically, because if you go through this scientific opinion, basically what they said is, okay, we have so many methods with different LOQs, with different recoveries and so on, that data, sometimes it's difficult to compare and to collect. Um, so they were establishing a limit of quantification of 0 0.01 nanogram per gram per sa of sample um, for all these congeners and some others BFRs, um, which basically means team BPTs uh, in sample. And I'm highlighting here BD209 uh, because, I mean, you all know that it's the tricky one and it's quite difficult to reach very low limits. Um, so what we were doing uh, basically was, okay, we have to establish a new method. Uh, we want to be really productive, so we don't want to spend like a whole week to have only a few samples. I would need um, at least 30 or 40 samples per week to be analyzed because Otherwise, we accumulate so many samples and yeah, we don't have time to, to analyze them all. So we were um, establishing, establishing a strategy to just uh, make the extraction as simple as possible and try to rely a lot on our instrument. Okay, so basically what we do is a solid liquid extraction um, with some salts to, to help with the separation of the phases um, using a acetate. And then we just do clean up um, by acid attack, so no fluoroxyl and nothing else. And then we just analyzing. So at the beginning we we didn't have the orbi, um, so we had to analyze with a triple quad, and it was working quite well for all kind of fish and seafood samples, um, but not for BD two hundred nine, of course. <laughs> I mean, it was impossible to reach the limits there, uh, but. It was not. It was possible, basically, with the orbit trap. And just sorry for the spoiler, but yeah, this is the final uh, <coughs> chromatogram that we obtained. So this is a real chromatogram of a tuna sample spiked at the beginning of, so before the extraction. And you can see all the, the congeners, including 209. Um, well, we just basically run out the whole validation, and I'm just going to explain you a little bit our strategy. But I'm not going to focus on the extraction. I can give you more details if you want, but um, I'm just going to focus on the instrumental part now. So how, how was this high-resolution mass spectrometry approach? Um, we know that Orbi can work in full scan quite well, so we didn't want to lose the information that we have for, from the isotopic pattern because it gives you a lot, a lot of information, especially when you have brominate, I mean, brominated compounds. And of course, based on the EPA method that was a reference for us, we just decided that we're going to choose one main peak for quantification and one other peak from the same isotopic pattern for um, confirmation. So that was the idea. Um, and here you can see an example for BD209 again, um, tuna sample, yeah, spiked before extraction also, and where we can easily see the quantification ion, the confirmation ion, and we can even in this case see the molecular ion. I mean, signal here is really low, but it gives you like a lot of, you know, that you are pretty sure that this is the BD209 and that you're gonna give a positive result and that's gonna be okay. So um, that was quite important for us. Um, 
So the first thing that we did is we optimized the, the um, parameters of the ion source. I mean, you can always go to default um, parameters, but I would say don't do that. Um, I would just suggest or advise just play a little bit with the instrument because that's what's so fun, at least for, for me. Um, so in this case, we find out that it was quite useful to tune the instrument for highest masses of the calibration gas. Um, then we had more sensitivity at higher masses. That's where our PVDs are, basically. And also there were some parameters that we um, just optimized um, manually. Um, and those were electron lens voltage and electron energy. So I'm just going to send you, uh, show you an example of, um, so this is the, the uh, response that we have when changing the electron energy from 25 to 70 electron volts. Um, so you all know that in GC we usually work at 70. Um, well, we were trying and we have seen that not many changes on the full spectrum, basically. So the, the full spectrum was looking similar. So it was not that there were any difference on fragmentation or whatever for the PVDs. But we have observed that for with 50 electron volts, the in, intensity was much higher. In some cases, it's almost double. So we basically optimized these parameters. And it was really important to have um, very good uh, LOQs. So what about the acquisition modes? I have said already that with the Orbitrab, you can work in many, many different works, um, working modes. Um, so here there is an example of the PBD standard, just showing some of the PBDs, so BD 49, 47, and 209. Um, and we were testing different acquisition modes, so full scan and different target scene modes, so some um, selection on the quadrupod uh, with different windows. Uh, from 4 Daltons to 50 Daltons. And what we saw, it was quite surprising, is what that, what that was that the for, for the full scan, um, the signal was much better, even double, than when we were using the quadrupole. So we said, OK, so I mean, if you saw that, you basically want to work in full scan, which is good, because at the end, you will have like all the data, and you can go back and have all the information that you want from your uh, from your analysis, and so not only target but also non-target analysis. So we were testing that in real samples because, of course, we don't analyze the standards; we analyze real samples, um, and that's the result for a tuna sample again, spiked with 0.01 nanogram per gram um, before extraction, and this is the full scan we we just run and the same mode uh, with 50 Dalton window. I, I'm gonna zoom it because. Yeah, I'm sure you cannot pretty see it. Um, just an example. So here we don't see much difference between the BD28 in full scan or in SIM mode. So it's around 28,000 and 30,000 signal there. Um, but just I just want to point out the, your attention here. So here is basically one peak disappearing. <laughs> and again, here we have a very difference on um, area intensity. So uh, what's going on here? Of course, we have matrix coelution. Um, as I told you, we were just simplifying so much the extraction that, of course, <laughs> there is some matrix entering into our instrument. Um, but I mean, that was our option, and that, that was our choice. So what we did is, OK, we're going to know why is this happening. And it has to do with the uh, C trap. Um, so what we see here in the case of full scan is that our C trap is full with ions in only 11 milliseconds, whereas at the same scan, our C trap is needs like uh, yeah like one order of magnitude more time, so 119 milliseconds to be full with our um, compounds. So it's basically that in full scan, as we do not to almost clean up. We have so many metrics that it's entering into the C-trap, and the C-trap is full, so the packet of ions is done, and those are sent to the Orbi, and our our analytes cannot reach really the C-trap. Um, well, no problem, don't worry, it's okay, we can use the quadrupole, and even with this 50 Dalton window, we can still have all the information of our isotopic pattern. 
Um, I was chatting with some of you yesterday, just going on some experience that you also also had with uh, GCQ RB. And you were saying that, well, you haven't observed that so much in your in your samples. Um, yeah, it's probably because we just, you know, uh, make it so easy, the extraction and almost no cleanup, that this is happening to us. But it also depends on what's your aim. So in our case, we wanted to go for target. So I don't mind if I do some full scan information, just reducing the window and working in SIM mode. Okay, but of course, it, it's an option only. So we have to validate the method. Uh, we have very good results on validation. Uh, we validate on tuna fish because it's one of the samples that we are receiving more. Uh, but of course, we had to test it in all kinds of different fish and seafood and also for eggs. Um, so these, these samples are already validated. And then now we are working on chocolate and cheese. But when I say cheese, it's like all kind of cheese. So basically, you can have from a roquefort to a camembert. So each sample, in our case, it's so different that that's why I was highlighting that we need very robust um, methods because I cannot spend time each time that I, re I receive a new sample on like redeveloping the method. It should work for all kind of samples. Um, what, what is more, um, in our case, I haven't, said, I haven't said it before, but we have a flexible scope accreditation, um, which basically means that we are, we are kind of obliged to um, receive any sample that someone, like some inspector or some customer may want to analyze, uh, and any analyte they want to analyze. Uh, we are public health lab, so we, have, we basically have to give response to this necessity. And this flexible uh, accreditation means that our quality system is so strict that we have to run validation in a way that uh, we have so many controls. But when the method is validated, we can just um, give the results with the uh, accreditation stamp already. So we don't need to wait for the uh, accreditation body to visit us again. So it's, it's much more fast and it's, it's really necessary for some cases because you need for legal, um, yeah, you have to go somewhere and, and it should be legally um, available and, and working. This report for the analysis should, be have, should have this accreditation, accreditation stamp. Um, so that's why it's so necessary that our methods are working in routine with no problems. Um, so yeah, just a few results of um, we were analy analyzing all kinds of fish, as I've said, monkfish. And here I was just highlighting, I, I don't see, we, I'm not sure you can see it, but it's basically we were uh, doing some kusi on, on cod fish and on shrimps. So just to test, okay, if I prepare my matrix match calibration in one kind of fi fish, how is the uh, CUSI uh, responding on another kind of fish? So what about the PCNs? Um, well, the extraction was common uh, because it was established like that for many years in the lab uh, with PBDs. Um, so at the beginning, what I was doing is I was preparing the samples and the final extract, I was just splitting in two different vials. So I was analyzing one in the uh, Orbi for PVDs and another one in the triple quad for the PCNs. But then, um, so that was at the beginning when I was only doing fish and seafood, but then the eggs come and the chocolates and the cheese and all the new samples. Um, and it was keeping more difficult to have um, low limits also for the PCNs because uh, we, we don't have really a regulation for these compounds, but our uh, local government is asking for data on these compounds. And so we establish ourselves a very low LOQ also, so 0 0.01, like for PVDs. And what we did finally is, okay, we're gonna have the same extraction, only one vial, and I'm gonna check PVDs, change column, because I cannot run PCNs in the same column as PVDs, and just analyze the, the PCNs. Okay, because here we need a longer column, but I mean, it's more suitable for us because this way I don't have the, those two instruments um, used at the time for the same method, basically. And here just some results on the octa chloronaphthalin. Um, well, we were reaching very good LOQs and we are running samples in routine. So in fact, um, 2016 samples were all already analyzed with Orbitrap 
at the end of the year, and we are running already the sampling campaign for this year. Okay, so just um, so for me, PVDs and PCNs were an example of how sensitivity is helping. Uh, it's very good in the RB, and, and we were able to uh, just give data to our uh, local government, and they are gonna give this data to the Spanish government, and the Spanish government is gonna this give this data to um, to Europe so that they can do some risk assessment. Um, and it was basically possible to reach these LOQs uh, thanks to the orbit trap because it was not possible before with the uh, with the triples that we had in the lab. Um, so what about pesticides? Um, I think it's a completely different story. So with pesticides, what you have is, is not so low LOQs. I mean, most of the regulated limits are around 10, 10, 10 PPBs um, or even higher. So it's not such a problem of uh, sensitivity, but of selectivity, because we usually apply a very um, well common method that is squatchers, um, which is not much cleanup. And while well, you basically use the same method for all kinds of matrices, and we have to analyze pesticides in many different foodstuffs. And also the list of pesticides is quite long. So at the moment in the lab, we're analyzing 250 pesticides um, together between GC and LC. So most of uh, 150 are in GC. Um, and sometimes we were having problems of some confirmation criteria based on iron ratio and this kind of thing. So, uh, in, in this sense, the ORB was helping just, as I said before, to confirm some of the positive results that we were having in the pesticides. So, how was this approach? As I said, we were analyzing pesticides like in every single matrix. So, we, we start focusing only on the um, so samples uh, not coming from the animals, so not feed or, or yeah, basically not feed or fat for the moment, but just vegetables, cereals, and all, all these kind of samples. Um, we were doing the same extraction as we do usually for the triple quad. Uh, in fact, we are still analyzing these compounds for the triple quad, and we will, we will just do it like that for many years now because it's working fine. But we wanted to see, okay, what's going on with the GCQ RB if, if we if we analyze in using it. So we basically copy all the part of the injector and the GC um, from the triple quad to the Orbi. And then we just establish a general method for the, uh, for the Orbi uh, based on full scan. So not much optimization in this case. So what we did, um, we take first at what we call a theoretical approach. Um, so we, we make a list of our pesticides that are in our scope. Um, we build a compound database and we fill uh, this compound database with the theoretical masses that we can, we can have in this library. Um, because yeah, we are lucky and we have libraries in GCMS so we can use them and pesticides is quite um, well known analyzed so everybody knows how, how are the masses and there is a lot of data on that. Um, so after that, we do the first experimental approach. So we analyze each single uh, compound solved in standard. Um, and we were doing some structural characterization, um, just identifying each fragment, because as I've said, the, the ion source is electron ionization. So there is some fragmentation in the ion already. Um, but we were selecting like the most five intense ions for each. Um, pesticide, and we were then updating our compound database, so comparing a little bit the full scan that we obtain um, in the Orbi with the uh, libraries that we have. And then, as I've said before, we are not analyzing standards, we are analyzing real samples. So we were testing again uh, with matrix match um, um, standards in nine different matrices, so including apple, honey, uh, tea, uh, rise, so all these kind of matrices. We were testing from 1 PPV to 10 PPVs um, to see, okay, can we see it? Can we detect them? How it looks like? Um, and basically we were yeah, doing some evaluation of choosing the best evaluation and confirmation ions because 
at the end it's like it, it maybe some of the ions are really like a small mass and they have like a lot of interferences so we can see maybe with the matrix it's more it's better to have another one so we were working a lot on on processing this data with with trace finder and basically we end up with a very complete compound database um, that was very useful for us because it was like all the pesticides listed there. Okay, but is it useful for everyday um, routine analysis that we do? Well, it, it, it really is. Uh, and how is this protocol applied? I'm going to show you an example to, so that you can understand how we are using it. So, uh, there was this uh, pesticide, Propargita, um, in, 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 it's regulated, okay? And we have a maximum residual limit of 10 ppbs in the orange. Um, they were arriving several different uh, samples of oranges at the lab at one point because there was an Europe alert. So that means that at some point someone was detecting some positive above this maximum residual limit. Um, so we were like starting to receive orange samples like crazy. Um, so what we do is we apply our normal protocol, um, analyze with catchers and triple quads. And here you can see the, the two transitions for uh, an orange uh, just spiked at 5 ppb level. Um, this is an orange sample, what we call orange sample 1. And you can see this has this huge peak. It's basically, if you, if you can see the one that was spiked, you have this huge interferences. So you may think, okay, this is basically these interferences here. And our analyte is this one, okay? But it's quite obvious that we have a problem of interferences there. And then we have this second orange sample, um, which looks, so based on the retention time, basically, you, you see that it's more in the same retention time as your as propagator. Uh, but anyway, it has like a very, yeah, not really nice shape on the front and also here. So you can, yeah, you can see that basically you have something under, under this peak. Um, when we were analyzing this, um, so this is the calibration curve and just spiked on orange and the two samples. So based on our identification and confirmation criteria, we would say, okay, or, orange sample one, it's negative. Orange sample two, it's positive. Uh, but the thing is that we were quantifying um, double of the maximum residual limit. So it was quite suspicious of exceeding this limit. But I mean, you see all these interferences and yeah, the ion ratio is in the limits, uh, not for sample one, but you're like, yeah, what's gonna happen with this sample is that if I said it's positive, it's basically that these oranges cannot enter Europe. Um, and probably the guy that it's just, you know, they want to sell it here, um, we may have some problem with him. Um, but otherwise, if, if it's double of the maximum residual limit, I don't want this orange to be in the market anyway. So it's basically, you have to decide whether, okay, just, uh, yeah, based on our criteria, this should be a positive and I just go ahead with that, or can I use another technique and be pretty sure of our, of our result? So that's what basically are doing with the LCQ Orbitrap, I'm sorry for the GCQ Orbitrap in the case of, of pesticides. So we took our general instrument method, full scan, um, yeah, typical gas chromatography, um, uh, gas chromatography for, for pesticides, and then our compound database we, where we had all our target ions and confirming ions already tested in matrix. And what we do is we analyze the samples. So here you can see the, uh, the same orange samples, uh, speak it at 5 ppb level. Yeah, this is the orange sample number one. And this is the orange sample number two. And if you see, um, so here I have the target ion, which in this case is the molecular ion. So yeah, basically based on the accurate mass, you know that this is propagated. Um, and then the two confirming ions. And yeah, we basically knew from the analysis and we were pretty sure that the results on the triple quad were, were fine, were okay. 
So we were basically confirming this presence of the propagita. So in our case, um, the Orbi in this case was showing much more selectivity than the triple quad, and it helped us um, to be more sure of the results that we were giving. Um, so that's the way we are applying uh, best sites analysis using GCQ or Retrap in, in our lab. So to conclude, just some take home message. Um, for us, GCQ Orbitrap or basically Orbitrap technology, it's a very useful tool for control labs. It has very good sensitivity, high selectivity for complex matrices. So we are using it a lot for, for these problems that we can have. It shows high robustness. Um, I was pushing the instrument so much at the beginning. I was injecting 200 tuna samples no changing the liner, no cleaning the ion source, um, not calibrating. So basically the engineer fields were mad at me, like, come on, what, what are you trying to do? I was like, well, I, I, I was just uh, sharing this, this story with you yesterday, uh, with some of you yesterday. It's like, I just want to know that I'm gonna just uh, leave a sequence on Friday and it's gonna be perfect on Monday because weekends we, we still don't work. So um, it, it was what I was trying to do. You have to know the limits of the instrument. It's a very new instrument. There are few in the world. Um, so we are so lucky that we have it in the lab. So just, you know, test it and, and try how it's working. Um, so in our case, it also helped to fulfill regulations. Uh, it was the case for PPDs. And it's, it's very useful also to confirm doubtful results um, so that we are pretty sure that the results are, yeah, are quite, quite good. But I'm an analytical chemist, so um, it's not plug and play, of course, this instrument. It's very um, um, friendly, I would say, but I would, I would recommend some expertise and some optimization and some just spending time with the instrument so that you can really have the best of it. Um, and with that, I would just yeah, share some pictures of my colleagues in the lab that they were helping a lot with the development of this work. And thank you all of you for your attention. Okay, thank you. We have time for several questions. Just a simple question, I think. Um, you, in the applications, you had mentioned that uh, the injection was PTV. In these cases, yes. And um, not for pesticides. Oh, not Sorry, for pesticides. I didn't. I didn't say it. It was split split less for pesticides. Okay. And for the PTV injection, what what type of volume? You I I was testing four microliters and six microliters, and at the moment I just leave it with six microliters. Yeah. I, I just wonder, can you use also different workflows together, such as like full scan and MS2? Yeah, you can combine them. Yeah. Okay. Have you tried to use that? No, no, not yet. Not yet. Um, the only thing that you have to take care of is uh, scan time. Uh, it's going to take much longer. Um, so it depends on your chromatographic peaks. You can have problems, but it depends on also on the resolution that you're going to use. If you're working maybe at 30,000, that would be enough probably to have two scans. Um, we were testing that on the LCQ Orbitrap at the beginning. Uh, but that instrument is much more slower than the GCQ Arbitrap, so it's much faster now. Uh, I haven't tried yet, no. Uh, do you have any regulation in Spain, like how many scans you have to have? I don't think there's a regulation like very strict, but uh, many recommendations and, and when the people from the accreditation body is coming, they are looking for minimum, yeah, 12, 15 scans. So they just show you, they just ask you many times, like, can you plot it in, in how, how is it called, scan filter, I think, so that it shows all the, the scans that you have in the peak. They are, they are asking for that, yeah. Uh, please join me in thanking Nuri one more time.